You know, you can listen to Thomas Friedman be interviewed by Charlie Rose and find out about his book. You can go to MIT World and watch him do a video. Well, he's probably paid lots of money to do these talks, and you can watch this free on the web in YouTube or YouTube EDU. You can go to blog posts and podcasts of people who summarize his book. You can go to his website on his book and add to the 17th chapter of his most recent book, Hot, Flat, and Crowded. You know, there's so many ways to learn from his contents today. Anyone can find out about this flat economic world. He has 10 trends. His 10 trends don't spell anything. There's no acronym. I'm going to give you an acronym for educational trends. But there are 10 important trends that you, we can walk through each one, but the main premise is that they're converging. And there are three P's that are happening to converge things. We have new players economically from Eastern Bloc countries of Europe, from China, from Malaysia, Thailand, Mexico, competing with North America and Europe. We have an equalized playing field brought on by collaborative technologies. And we have management processes that have been flattened. When I was in a cube farm as a cor corporate controller, you know, we had these hierarchies. Now with wikis, people at Best Buy and IBM have a voice no matter where they are in the ranking. They can add to comments about human resources and you know, benefit plans. Wikis and blogs give employees ownership over ideas, right? And so we've got to change here the three Ps the processes, playing field, and new players. That's in the economic world. In the education world, we have a different set of three Ps that I'm going to come back to here in a little bit. My friend uh, David Smith says the world is curved to explain the financial crisis. In fact, the subtitle of the mortgage crisis was only the beginning. It was only the start of all the problems we're going to see in the financial world over the next few years because of hedge funds and other things. Uh, the changes that might happen in China that impact on us or on us and our uh, kind of shoddy lending practices on Wall Street that impacted the rest of the world, right? And we're not taking the blame for it, of course, but uh, we are, we are a, a main player in what happened there. But the world is curved, and why are 401k plans, if you're a faculty member, lost 30 40%? It's explained in this book. So is the world flat economically? Is it curved financially? Is it spiky creatively? Places in the world that are creative cities, at the top of the list for medium cities is Austin, Texas. We look for spiky, innovative places where all you creative people come to go. Now, when I was a graduate student 20 years ago, I was only reading stuff from Austin, Texas, because they had created the Daedalus Project. And they had Stephen Witte and Lester Fagley here looking at revision and writing, which was my dissertation. So I was reading scores of articles, and then the Computers and Writing Conference was here in 91, and my colleagues were presenting the research. I couldn't come down here, but in the late 80s, early 90s, this was a hot bed for my area, my dissertation on writing and computers and writing and keystroke mapping and all that. This is, this is the hot bed for a lot of creative capital, for a lot of creative companies and high-tech companies, you see. There's spikiness, according to Richard Florida. Now, Richard Florida is misnamed. He's in Toronto, but his name's Florida. He's in the School of Management there. And a lot of people like his books. You can find out, you know, you undergrads want to find a creative place to live. Well, you got Seattle and Boston and Austin and Madison, Wisconsin, and places like that where people tend to cling to. If you're international, Singapore, Seoul, and Tokyo, and London, and places like that tend to attract people who are more creative in nature or more innovative. There's, the world is not totally flat. It doesn't mean that everyone in the world, that you know, people in the northeastern part of Thailand can always compete because their internet might not be as robust as it is in Seattle or Austin or in parts of South Africa. It might not be as good or in Jamaica. So it, Richard says that the world is spiky. There are, there are these flatteners around the world, but we do need to have creative capital to tap into. Now in education, People are saying the world is not flat, it's not curved, it's not spiky, but it's open. And three years ago when I was in Houston at Rice University, where I was yesterday running around Rice campus, they had a conference for the Hewlett Foundation, and that, and that conference was about open education. Now, Obama administration has hired two people who are big, big players in the open administration, and they're, they're, he's funding $50 million a year over 10 years to create open courses at the community college level and the high school level. He hires Martha Cantor from Foothill College in San Francisco, the president, 
as his Undersecretary of Education. She was among those players at Rice Campus three years ago. He hired Marshall Smith from the Hewlett Foundation, who gave away $70 million to create open courses at MIT and Carnegie Mellon and other places. Well, sitting at a table next to me during that conference was a, a, a two people, I can't pronounce their names, uh, uh, Vijay Kumar and Toro Yushi. And I said, what are you doing? They said, we're, writing a, we're editing a book. We're calling it Opening Up Education. They said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm here collecting stories from people because I want to write a book. Initially, it was called uh, The Education World is, is, is Flat or something like that. Or, you know, and uh, it ended up becoming The World is Open. So we were working on similar projects there at, at, at Rice three years ago. Now, this book is available free. You can download it from MIT Press. All the chapters are free. The authors have YouTube videos up explaining their chapters. There's discussion forums around their chapters. So if you all are in, how many of you have Facebook accounts? You know, Facebook's about social networking, right? It's about collaborating and communicating. Well, this books are becoming open in that way so that the authors communicate with you. You find out about things you didn't know about previously. Okay, so opening up education is one example. Yale Press and MIT Press are two of the presses that are creating a lot of open access books. Now, the university presses about six months ago banded together and said, we're a dying breed. If we don't make you know, our, our books available as e-books, we're going to go out of business. So many of them are today. But this is a, a really great book. It's more academic. And many of the people that I talk about today will be in this book. They have chapters in this book. My book's more of a trade book. This is more of an academic book. Now, when I finished writing my book a year and a half ago, I started touring the world, and uh, people in Korea up here at Incheon and in, in Inha University said, Kurt, the world is open. I was in Saudi Arabia, some uh, Egyptian uh, instructors there in, uh, in Seoul, again in Saudi, in, in the UAE. Wherever I go around the world, uh, waitress staff, hotel staff, wherever I go, people are telling me, except my son here, he just, he's not really sure. In uh, the Palace Emirates Hotel, everybody's, the world is open, and had people visit me from Lufthansa, they, they, they sent me this postcard back, the world is open, so. The world is really open when you have a smart globe that's web-enabled, when you can get updates on census, you know, population records, demographics of different states and countries around the world, it's all through a USB port, when you have a smart globe, this is truly indicative of, of an open world. Now, my grandfather's a story I, I embed throughout both books, the free ebook and, the, and, the, and the, the physical book. My grandfather was born in 1907, exactly 100 years prior to when I started writing my book. And he worked for Alice Chalmers factory in West Dallas, Wisconsin, where I grew up. Now, my grandfather would tell me stories about going to high school. And he had one story, really, that was prominent every time. He said, Kurt, I walked in the front door of my high school, and I walked out the back door, and I never went to high school. And, you know, my grandmother ended up working at Alice Chalmers during the Depression when my grandfather lost his job. My mother worked there part-time, my father for a brief bit. My uncle worked there for his whole life till he was laid off here it went, in 1986. It went out of business. These are jobs that we can't rely on anymore. So my grandfather worked there as an inspector for 40-odd years, right? Uh, my point in the book is every chapter of the book, whether we're talking about podcasting or interactive global video conferencing or wikis or whatever the technology is, are enticements for people like my grandfather not to go in the front door and out the back door. We have to think thoughtfully on how to utilize these technologies for learning so that we don't lose these people along the way. This gentleman here, his name is Paul, uh, is, uh, not Paul his name is uh, Wiedemeyer and Charles Wiedemeyer. I say Paul DeVore. Sorry, Paul. Um, <laughs> he has a famous book, Learning at the Back Door. For one dollar, you can buy this on Amazon. It was the best one dollar book I've ever bought. And he basically is talking about this little Russian kid looking in through the back door of a school, an elitist school, that he wasn't allowed full participation in. He couldn't go in the front door of that school back in the day. But you see, what Wiedemeyer said is through audio tapes, through computers, through satellite television. These kids can now go through the front door and have the resources that this kid has at his home. Everybody has the resources. With the web today, we have resources to all MIT contents. 1,925 courses from MIT are free on the web. This was not possible previously. All Stanford courses are on the web for free. Okay, now undergraduates, and the undergraduates in here, 